On this update, we're going to look at the new Disney Genie System and Lightning Lanes. These are services that will affect both Disneyland and Disney World. These systems with paid options will replace FastPass Plus and in California, MaxPass. Disneyland and Disney World are two of the most complicated vacation destinations because to effectively plan a vacation, you need to know when and how to book your restaurants, when and how to reserve your days at the park, when and how to reserve individual rides. If I were visiting New York, I might make a reservation at a particular restaurant and I might buy tickets for a Broadway play. But both of these activities rely on systems used pervasively throughout the world. For those Broadway tickets, I just use Ticketmaster or a similar system. Disney uses proprietary systems with idiosyncratic features. On this update, we'll look at the forthcoming Genie and Lightning Lane systems. There's no specific announced date for their debut, but both will likely be in place before the winter holidays, perhaps even in early autumn. But before we discuss the ins and outs of these new systems, at least what we know so far, I want to point out that this is our second podcast for the weekend. This episode falls into our traditional news and analysis episodes. We'll talk about what's happening and what it means. But on Saturday, I posted up the Fall 2020 Travel Guide for Disneyland, which runs about one hour. That episode looks at recent crowd patterns, post-pandemic dining opportunities, and visit strategies to maximize your time at the California Resort. So if you're jumping into this episode at the start of your week, you'll find one more new episode in your feed right behind this one. It's been a busy week here. As you probably know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. Without subscribers, we would simply cease to exist. I have another round of Bandcamp subscribers that I would like to thank. Gratitude is going out today to Rascal of Cowtown, J.G. Crawdad, B.L. Doug, Fire Medic Tom, Raz, Mike H., T.S., B. Hansley, and Sega Sonic. Thanks to each of you for supporting this show. And now let's take a look at the future of the resorts, how Disney plans to manage its American properties in the months moving forward. The trend at Disney resorts post-pandemic, Disney World in particular, has been to uncouple previously packaged services. Airlines did this a couple of decades ago. Back in the 1990s, when flying, a typical domestic passenger would receive a seat reservation, checked bag allowance, snacks, and an in-flight meal as part of their ticket. Now, for most domestic flights, those services are typically offered a la carte. The Disney Resort in Florida is working through a similar uncoupling process. Disney Park guests used to receive free access to FastPass Plus. Hotel guests used to receive extra magic hours, complimentary self-parking, complimentary transportation to and from the resort on the Magical Express buses, and early access to FastPass. The Disney Resort will still have some version of most of these services, though in the near future, many will have an extra a la carte price tag. From a business standpoint, this is a way to raise costs without sticker shock. Hotel rates and ticket rates can stay the same, but to receive the full range of services previously provided, guests need to add them individually, which raises the overall price. And from a consumer perspective, those who don't use additional services, such as Magical Express, aren't absorbing the cost into a bundled price. The biggest point of contention, at least if you skim through the online forums, has been the decision to remove free fast passes from the park experience. Admittedly, 
FastPass Plus perhaps wasn't the best queue management system, particularly for the typical tourist. You needed to know when to book your Fast Passes, either 30 or 60 days out, and you had to plan which attractions you wanted to visit a month or two before your vacation, which limited spontaneity. The system privileged frequent visitors who knew the ins and outs of Fast Pass, and the system deprivileged the type of tourist who visited Disney World every three, five, or ten years. But the decision to migrate away from free FastPass has upset a number of longtime fans and regular visitors. This has played out in very public ways on discussion board after discussion board, often with the idea that the attractions would be more difficult or more costly to access. But I want to approach this from a different angle, at least with this one service the desire of frequent guests, and the desire of the resorts align. Disney loses money if guests spend the majority of their day in line. Guests in line don't shop for souvenirs, they don't spend as much money in restaurants and on snacks, and they tend to leave dissatisfied and then post their reactions online. Even from a pure profit consideration, the needs of Disney as a business aren't served by a system that keeps guests in line and away from other, more enjoyable activities where they are likely to spend money. We just talked about this on the DHI Travel Guide posted on Saturday, but according to a study in the last decade, the average American at a theme park is comfortable with a 21.3 minute wait. I'm guessing if you look at your own preferences, you'll likely find some truth to this. If the average American has a casual interest in riding the teacups, they'll get in that line if it looks to be 21.3 minutes long or less. If it appears longer than that, they'll need to consider how much they want to experience this particular attraction. If they really want to experience it, maybe it's Everest or Flight of Passage, they'll still get in that line. Or if they perceive that there are no other better experiences for a similar wait time, they might get in that line anyway. But on average, on a typical day, 21 minutes is the point between casual experience and an experience that requires some contemplation. I should point out that for residents of many Asian countries, the point at which they need to consider the value of an attraction is with a 15-minute line. Americans are more acclimated to waiting in line compared to people in at least some other countries. So on an average day, for all guests, there needs to be some attractions that are under that 21-minute wait time mark. The Carousel, the Speedway, the People Mover, Bear Country, Hall of Presidents, Little Mermaid, and so on. It's literally a no-win situation for Disney if they create a system in which one group of visitors endlessly spends time in line. Even if the system is not perfect when it debuts, and that's a possibility, it will by necessity be adjusted to the point where most guests on a typical day are not spending an inordinate amount of time in line. If guests are spending too much time in line, Disney loses money. Guests are also upset. No win. So, this is an attempt to monetize a certain segment of the ride experience while also attempting to keep ride times manageable for most attractions for most guests. It's also a system that privileges the infrequent visitor over the frequent visitor. I live in California. Disneyland is my home resort, though I've spent a lot of time in the Florida resort. If I were to go to Disneyland for an evening spending a few hours in the park, how likely would I be to purchase the new Genie Plus system for $20, which would allow me to reserve space at attractions? Honestly, not very likely. For years, Disneyland has had Max Pass. I rarely used it unless it was a particularly busy day, such as during the winter holidays. I mostly enjoy being in the park environment rather than being on the rides. But if I were to travel to Japan to spend a few days at Tokyo Disneyland, how likely would I be to use a paid fast pass service to optimize my time there? Well, I'd be very likely to do that. 
So in this, I can see some situations where I'd feel good about a paid fast pass option. I can see some situations where I'd casually use it, and I can see some situations where I'd mostly ignore it. Again, with the idea that simply because Disney needs to optimize its business model through guest spending, the end outcome would be that most guests would have reasonable access to many attractions with or without the service. There are essentially three services in this new bundle that replaces FastPass Plus. First, there is the free Genie option, which is integrated into the existing My Disney Experience app and presumably into the Disneyland app as well. The free Genie service will suggest attractions with low wait times, and again, we've recently discussed this tool from the perspective of an industrial engineer on that just posted DHI tour guide. The suggestions on the Genie Plus app about what attraction to visit move guests from a high-capacity area to a low-capacity area to more evenly distribute guests throughout the park. How effective will this be in better distributing guests? Well, that depends on how many people use it. It also depends on how willing guests are to mediate their visit through a phone app. When guests are on phones in the park, I believe they're mostly on social media. One of the challenges will be to communicate with guests who, even though they are on their phones, aren't on a Disney app. It's hard to say, but this system might only be marginally more effective at distributing guests throughout the park than the current set of Disney Resort apps. The free Genie services offer suggestions based on guest interest and wait times in standby lines. For example, guests can say they're interested in thrill rides, and the Genie system will suggest thrill rides with low wait times. The other two services are paid options, and this has been the focus of much uproar online this past week. One system is similar to the old FastPass Plus system, and one is not. And I want to start with the more controversial of the two, the one that is meaningfully different than FastPass. All FastPass lanes will be called Lightning Lanes, but in fan groups over the past week, Genie Plus is generally the name used for those attractions coupled with the Genie Plus service, even though you enter through Lightning Lanes. And Lightning Lane is being used to describe the paid Lightning Lanes in which certain attractions have a designated per-ride pass upcharge. So the paid Lightning Lanes allow guests to immediately or near immediately access certain attractions for a per entry fee. I should point out that these attractions are still open to regular guests, so this is a line bypass fee. Disney has suggested that, at least in Florida, they would have, quote, up to two highly demanded paid Lightning Lane options per park. Among those they have specifically mentioned are Rise of the Resistance at Hollywood Studios, the forthcoming Remy's Ratatouille Adventure at Epcot, and Seven Dwarves Mine Train at Magic Kingdom. I think it's a good bet that, assuming there's at least one Lightning Lane at Animal Kingdom, it would go to Flight of Passage. Those rides that use a virtual queue system would still continue to have a free virtual queue system for boarding passes, only in this new system. A certain number of boarding passes would be held back for Lightning Lane purchases. Exactly what percentage is anyone's guess? But I have trouble imagining a system where more than 20% of boarding passes would be called for a paid option. For this system to work, as a day's admission is still well over $100, I think Disney would need to uphold an image that the vast majority of boarding passes for highly desired attractions are still given out to regular guests without an upcharge. If there are up to two paid Lightning Lane rides at each park, there's a little guessing game as to which would be the second. The goal for the program is to present a cost to avoid a long line. Just going by average yearly wait times, Slinky Dog would be the likely second pick at the studios. By average yearly wait times, Splash Mountain should be the second pick at Magic Kingdom. But on a Genie Plus training video, 
one that was likely directed at travel agents, you can see on one screen that Space Mountain is the second paid Lightning Lane attraction at the Magic Kingdom. I'm guessing that the target audience for paid Lightning Lanes, younger professionals likely traveling without kids, would be more interested in Space Mountain than Splash Mountain. Personally, I'm skeptical that Animal Kingdom and Epcot will have a second paid lightning lane when this system rolls out. The official announcement uses the phrase up to two. The attraction with the second highest wait time in Animal Kingdom is Navi River Journey, and I can't imagine both attractions in Pandora having a lightning lane. And the likely pick at Epcot is Test Track, but as that attraction has been around for decades, I suspect that it's no longer the type of draw that could demand a premium charge similar to newer attractions. For California, the two listed attractions are Rise of the Resistance at Disneyland and Radiator Springs Racers at DCA. It's possible that each California park may have a second attraction with a lightning lane as well. At DCA, this would almost surely be Web Slingers. At Disneyland, again, Splash Mountain, by wait time alone, would be the next logical pick, but I suspect that either Indiana Jones or Space Mountain would appeal more to those willing to purchase paid lightning lanes. The other paid service is called Genie Plus. This service is very much like Fast Pass or Max Pass. It gives guests access to lines with a short wait time. What rides will be included in the Genie Plus service? Well, Disney hasn't announced a list, but those examples they give suggest that the Genie Plus rides will be very similar to those previously under Fast Pass, minus one or two centerpiece rides at each park. These are the examples from the announcement, quote, from Haunted Mansion to thrill rides like Big Thunder and newer favorites like Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run. Other examples and the promotional materials include Dumbo, Buzz Lightyear, and Jungle Cruise. There will be roughly 40 attractions on the Genie Plus service at Disney World divided among the four parks and roughly 15 at the Disneyland Resort, again divided between the two parks. Before the pandemic, the Disneyland Resort had about 15 Fast Pass options. Before the pandemic, Disney World, however, had far more than 40 experiences, but many of these were shows and characters. It seems, though, that the new system will be specifically targeted at attractions rather than the type of wider range experiences that were embraced by the Florida Fast Pass system. I'm guessing, though I'm not positive, that guests will first need to purchase the Genie Plus system to then be able to purchase the paid Lightning Lane options. On that training video, the one directed at travel agents, Disney showed how the system worked. One of the interesting elements in the video was the timing of the system. Genie Plus was demonstrated on a computer graphic of a smartphone, with the time set to 9.41 a.m. And in the video, many of the next Genie Plus attraction options were two to three hours away. I suspect that the production team likely thought through scenarios before putting a very specific 9.41 time on the graphic of the smartphone. So this suggests that on an average operating day, maybe you will be able to reserve five or six Genie Plus experiences over the course of a 12-hour visit. With the old FastPass Plus system, I'd typically book three in advance and then maybe two or three later in the day. So I think the outcome here will be similar. At Disney World, the Genie Plus service is priced at $15 per day. At Disneyland, $20 per day, though it also includes PhotoPass downloads, which have never been a huge seller at Disneyland, unlike Disney World. It's probably worth noting how the price will affect the density of park guests who decide to purchase Genie Plus. Universal Orlando offers an express pass to quickly enter rides, which, depending on the day and options, runs generally between $70 and $120 per guest. Universal sells very few of these passes, so the option doesn't substantially raise the time for the regular standby line. The Universal option has a low guest density. 
the Disney plan seems to be the opposite, to have a less expensive entry point, which allows more families to purchase them, and specifically to make them nearly essential for vacationing families with limited time to wait in line and experience attractions. At a lower price point, they will have a higher number of guests purchasing them, which will place a higher wait time burden on the standby line. And this, I suspect, is the part that Disney likely needs to figure out once the system debuts. How to manage the experience of those with the optional system against those without the optional system. And in my opinion, the system here is a mixed bag. Let's start with the positives. The overall upsides are, well, there's more spontaneous planning. Guests don't need to plan out their fast pass attractions 30 or 60 days in advance, so there's no more getting up at the crack of dawn to log on to the Disney World server. It also moves the advantage from the very experienced Disney Park regulars to traditional tourists. The overall downsides are, well, first off, it does move a previously included service to a paid add-on. This is a way of raising the overall price of a full park experience without increasing the face price of a Disney ticket. It also contributes to a narrative that the Disney parks are becoming very expensive, which may be a difficult narrative for Disney to manage as they try to move beyond the pandemic. And lastly, it's another complicated system that is technology dependent. Disney parks work great for those who regularly visit them. People like you listening to this podcast can absorb the changes gradually. But if you aren't a Disney regular, if you haven't been to a park in a decade, here's just a short list of things you need to figure out before you head over to the resort. How to make early dining reservations, how to book transportation to and from your hotel property, which used to be included, how to use mobile ordering, how and when to request a free boarding pass for a standby queue, who has access to those extra evening hours? How to use Genie, Genie Plus, and paid lightning lanes. In that, there's a lot of specific idiosyncratic information pertinent only to the Disney parks. It's a lot for regulars to absorb. But if you're a casual guest, unfamiliar with the parks, heading down to Orlando or Anaheim for a long weekend, it could seem overwhelming. I'm not sure that adding three new services, Genie, Genie Plus, and Paid Lightning Lanes, will lower the complexity burden that casual tourists face. So what's the overall upcharge for the full package? At Disney World, the Genie Plus service is $15 a day. At Disneyland, $20. Each park can have up to two attractions that are designated as paid lightning lanes and not included in the general Genie Plus service. It's unclear how much these will cost. At Paris Disneyland, which recently debuted a similar service, paid fast passes cost between $9 and $18 per attraction. Guests in America are allowed to buy two lightning lanes per day. My guess is that there will be a type of variable pricing for these, similar to surge pricing for rideshare services. On a very busy day, paid lightning lanes will cost more as you bypass a longer line. On not so busy days, they will cost less. You are essentially paying for the reduction of the line, not for the opportunity to experience the ride. But let's estimate that two paid Lightning Lane services would cost a total of $30 or $15 each. That would place the add-on for Genie Plus and Lightning Lanes at $45 per day for Florida or $50 per day in California. Multiply that times four for a family of four and then multiply that again times four for a family wishing to spend one day in each of the four parks in Florida. That's $720. And that there is the major point of contention that's being hashed out on various fan forums. I suspect, though, that certain rides, like Rise of the Resistance, will cost more than $15 for paid Lightning Lane access. But that's only a guess. This service is not directed at the wealthy. It's being pitched as a general service toward middle and middle upper class families. This seems fairly clear in how the system is laid out. The paid lightning lanes are capped at two per day. 
so that guests don't create their own version of the upper end and reasonably popular VIP tour groups where guests can bypass the lines at all major attractions. VIP tours cost between $425 and $850 per hour with a 7-hour minimum. One of the prime benefits of the VIP tour system is bypassing the line. So Disney seems cognizant that they need to limit the paid lightning lanes so that they don't diminish their VIP business. There's another element here, not openly discussed, on which I'm conflicted. One of the barriers to creating certain high-cost rides at Disney parks is the hourly throughput. Certain ride designs have been rejected or drastically modified so that the parks can move more guests through them per hour, in some cases reducing the quality of the attraction. But with paid lightning lanes, Disney might have a mechanism to fund the development of more costly attractions, even if they don't have a high hourly throughput. A long time ago, this was how Walt Disney himself funded some experimental small capacity attractions at Disneyland, such as the Tiki Room, which for its day was cutting edge. When it opened, back when all park attractions had a paid ticket, the Tiki Room was the most expensive attraction in the park, a 15-minute experience that cost about the same as a ticket to a movie at a first-run theater. I've got to think about this some, as I'm not quite sure I've considered all of the options here. But direct per-ride revenue might be a way for the company to justify the development of some very expensive attractions, even those that don't have high hourly numbers. But I should point out that when the Tiki Room opened, admission to the park was $1.60, about $14 today, with each ride requiring its own ticket. There's one more element here. Disney wants to keep overall profits high. If this a la carte of services pushes enough potential customers away, I suspect that Disney will modify some of these strategies. And if the Genie Plus system increases standby lines to the point that they see a substantial reduction of food and retail spending, they will need to tweak that as well. There's also that complexity barrier especially for some less technologically familiar guests, in which the reliance on unique systems creates a burden that can also make the experience less enjoyable. There are a lot of variables in this equation. But in terms of bringing services back online, we've indicated that some type of fast pass or fast pass replacement system was essential for the parks, particularly in Florida, to rebuild from the problems of the pandemic. This is a system that should allow for higher numbers of guests to successfully engage the parks. It's also a system that, by managing increased capacity, should allow the Florida resort to move toward a dining plan. The other two elements here for the dining plan are food supply reliability and labor shortages, though with the college program reopened, some of those labor problems are now solved, at least at the Florida resort. I want to end this update where I started it, with the idea of uncoupling services, particularly from on-property hotels in Florida. For years, one of the sales pitches for the on-property hotels used to be a fairly wide array of additional benefits beyond proximity to the four parks. There were extra magic hours, early access to fast passes, which I felt was very valuable, access to dining programs, and Magical Express. In many ways, I felt these additional elements justified the higher price for an on-property room. But without these additional benefits, Disney may have more difficulty convincing guests to book an on-property room when comparable off-property rooms run about half as much. On-property guests with Genie Plus can book their first ride at 7 a.m., whereas off-property guests will still need to wait until the park opens. Guests in deluxe rooms have access to additional hours in the evening at the parks, but that's still only a small percent of the on-property guests. I suspect this new package of benefits may not be large enough to persuade enough guests to book on-property rooms. If I had to guess the area 
that will first be modified in this new system, I'd pick some type of additional or enhanced benefits for on-property guests, as on-property guests not only pay Disney for the hotel, but tend to eat more meals on property as well. But all of these things will be worked out in the coming year, and here we can finally see some of the framework that will define the new guest experience at the resorts as we move beyond the pandemic. It's been a busy week here, so a reminder, right behind this episode in your podcast feed is a full audio guide to the Disneyland Resort in California, where we break down crowd patterns, explore restaurant and hotel options, and offer some tips to improve your trip to the resort. Later this year, we'll do another audio guide focused on the Florida resort. But as you can see from today's episode on the Genie Service, these guides will need to be updated multiple times in the coming year, and they'll be updated over on Bandcamp. If you enjoy these episodes, if you find them a meaningful part of your week, please support us and the research we do here by becoming a monthly Bandcamp subscriber. On Bandcamp, you'll find dozens of extra episodes, but the best reason to subscribe is to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can subscribe at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link in the show notes. I'll be back next Sunday, and at least right now, the plan is to put together an episode focused on the history of the Disney Company. Until next time, this is Todd James Pierce.